Breaches and cybersecurity incidents are making headlines every day. What are you doing to be prepared? Welcome to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast, brought to you by Tripwire, the show that explores cybersecurity for the enterprise and how to identify and protect against cyber threats before they happen. Listen for techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. Now, here's your host, Tim Erlen. Welcome, everyone, to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. I'm Tim Erlen, VP of Strategy at Tripwire. And today I am joined by Patrick Miller, uh, CEO of Ampere uh, Industrial Security and founder of EnergySec. Um, Patrick, you've been in this industry for, gosh, how long now? It's been a long time. <laughs> uh, far too long. <laughs> yeah. Far too long. Yeah, we'll go Far too that. long. Okay. Yeah, like like 30 years or 35 years. <laughs> I don't know. We're not counting anymore at this point. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's interesting. There's a when when we talk about um IT security as opposed to sort of the the industrial side of things, um there's certainly there's some folks with experience that goes a bit beyond 20 years, but when you start getting past 20 years, you, you can start asking the question of whether there was really an industry to be a part of. Um but I think with with industrial uh you know, there's a, a sort of a longer tenure possible, um, and it you know it, it's that that marriage between uh, security and reliability. It sort of it sort of creates a, a longer longer tail for I think the industrial side of things than sometimes the IT side, which is is interesting to consider. Yeah, I agree, and it even goes back into uh, arguably the the safety aspect has been around in the industrial side, and it it you know, it's supported by security, but they've had to think like this for a, a considerable amount of time. Yeah, that's quite true. That's true. That's true. Um, so, you know, today, uh, the conversation that, that, that I wanted to have today, it, it really started with a, a conversation that you and I were having about sort of a, a historical pattern that that uh, occurred in the telecom industry. And I, I wanted to sort of yeah. start by setting the stage for the, the listeners so that we can get on to the, the, the meat of the conversation. But I think that context is important. So can you just start by describing that that pattern that we were talking about? Sure. Yeah. Speaking of, of age, <laughs> uh, some of us remember uh, back in the early days, gosh, we even had to get things like, you know, paid extra for a private line versus a party line. But there were these features like call waiting, caller ID. Uh, you paid outrageous amounts for long distance. And today, uh, I, you know, I can travel all across North America with my mobile phone and I've got unlimited bandwidth and I've got uh, no long distance fees no matter what country I'm in. So it, this and my bill, you know, even back then the bill was probably around, you know, twenty or thirty bucks. But if you take inflation, it's roughly the same, you know, in terms of what it is for your, like, you know, the amount percent of your income for your your phone, your your phone tech. And it's it's not like they suddenly just got super efficient or got really good at what they did, and they can deliver you all of these new services at you know roughly no additional cost. Um, you know, the, the reality is, is they're they're making money. They're making that money up in other ways. Uh, they're making it up by essentially harvesting uh, lots of data. Uh, some of it's customer data. A lot of it is just general usage data patterns. And they're selling all of that data because, you know, as you've heard, many have said now that, you know, data is the new oil. Um, and some have also said that data is the new toxic waste. I mean, I'm sure it's a little of both. Um, but the fact is, is very evident that data is worth money. I mean, and if it wasn't, then ransoms wouldn't be as big as they are to get your data back, that kind of thing. So, you know, the, the reality is they're, they're getting um, additional income. They're supporting the revenue stream of providing you, you know, a telecom service by selling the data that they generate by providing that service. So there was a effectively a, we're talking about a transformation, you know, in the telecom industry from. Uh, generating revenue by selling services to consumers to bringing in really a, a, a secondary and I, you know I don't know if it's the primary at this point but significant revenue stream from collecting and marketing and selling the data of those consumers uh, it's a it's a fascinating transition to think about and we're we're really in the telecom industry we're really on the other side of that at this point right yeah and it was it wasn't you know it's not like it happened overnight there wasn't some you know they didn't flip a switch and say, hey, we're suddenly going to start doing this. It was it it was a low and slow growth. And it was kind of that slow boil to where you don't really notice it. And as consumers now, we don't really think about it. Right. It's it's not something you think about when you pull up your phone and you you know check Twitter or you, you know, you get on your app and you do something or you check on the kids with a FaceTime call or something like that. I mean, you don't think about all of those, you know, 
little bits of data that you're leaving behind that somebody else is picking up and selling. Um, and you know, it's they didn't really need to uh, ask for a big you know permission from anybody because it it happened so slowly over time that there were little tiny bits of permission that were given away over such a long period of time that we ended up where we are now. Hmm. But for somebody yeah. else, for example, to pick this market up, it would look very different, right? Because they didn't have that history. Well, I, I think that's really where the, the conversation leads, because it, it, the interesting part about this is not sort of the, the history of, of telecom and, and you, know, um, you know, data selling, data marketing. It's, it's where you see that pattern starting to repeat itself today. And that's what really caught my interest here. So let, let's move towards that. Where is it that, that this pattern is, is showing up again that you've noticed? And um, let's, let's talk about that. Right. Well, I think it's, it's going to show up, you know, everybody else has figured out that's what's going on. And other businesses that have similar business models where they provide some sort of, you know, service and it's a utility like service. Um, then it makes sense to possibly do something similar to, to you know offset the revenue stream. So it, no one wants to pay more for any of their electric bills, gas bills, water bills. Um, so you know every time there's a rate increase, you know it's the the terrible utility is now you know getting deeper into the pockets of the consumers. When in reality, in order for them to continue to provide service, you know as the service grows and expectations grow and dependencies grow on those services, they they do need to raise rates. I mean, do they need to make you know crazy amounts of profit? Ah, that's where regulation sits in and kind of keeps them in check. But um, it's the the revenue side that uh, I think is where the change is going to happen. So if you know one of the examples that I am starting to see, at least the conversations are starting, and they're moving beyond just this kind of uh, can we do this too? But it's it's going it's moving to how do we do this as well? Uh, like for an electric utility, for example. Um, of course, they, they, they're they in business to, you know, provide electrons to your house and or your business or whatever. And that requires an enormous amount of technology. It requires, you know, when you flip the switch, you have no idea of the complex array of technology that goes into making sure that the electrons happen in your house. Um, so what we're seeing is all of the, the equipment that like we'll just pick an electric utility, for example, um, they use to manage their grid and to manage it from, you know, where power is generated to how it gets on a long transmission line and ultimately ends up at your house or your business. Um, there's a, there's so much technology there and that stuff's been around, you know, in some cases like a hundred years or more like the history of electricity in North America. So as we replace the old stuff and put the new stuff in, all that new stuff is digital. I mean, there's not any analog components that you can buy anymore. There's no you know, electromechanical stuff. You have to buy that on eBay if you're lucky. So all the stuff that's being made that they're building new power systems with and they're maintaining older power systems with, it's all digital. So it's all creating data. So every one of those little digital components has some kind of data stream. And that's the data that we're talking about. Basically, once that's, once all of those things start generating data and the, the company has this, you know, giant lake of data, they begin to wonder, huh, you know, of course, we can use this to maximize efficiency. So we look at things like, you know, I can I can manage my grid better at getting all this this data. Sure, that's part of it. So their costs will go down eventually that way. But they've also got this, you know, gold mine of, of data that they're sitting on, and they're looking at ways to try to create new data products out of that. Well, so let, let's pause there for a second because I, I want to address two two things in there. One, I think there's a at least in the the cybersecurity space, maybe not beyond it. Th there's a perception that. Um, industrial cybersecurity is, you know, it's really challenged or it's really about trying to secure, you know, older technology, legacy technology that's been connected to a network that probably wasn't designed to be connected to the network. As you even pointed out, you know, some of this technology is 100 years old. Um, but, you know, we go back just 10, 20, 30 years. But at the same time, there's an interesting contradiction in there because we are, as consumers, you know, as governments, just we're asking these utilities to modernize. In some cases, they have to just to continue providing the service. But in right. many cases, we're pushing them to modernize, to deliver, you know, cleaner energy. Um, and uh, that modernization means that we're introducing new technologies into those environments as well. So I want to call that out because it's not, industrial cybersecurity isn't just about securing legacy technologies. It's that that mixture of the new that's coming in as well. Isn't that right? Yeah, absolutely. And this this is a, a completely separate challenge. And in the 
the industrial security space, you end up with, you have to secure, you know, that refrigerator sized RTU, this old piece of equipment. Uh, at the same time, you have to secure, you know, the, the little bitty tiny thing that like the size of an iPhone, you know, and it does the work of like 20 or 30 of those other older RTUs and many other things. So the, the, the breadth of time and the span of technology that anyone in ICS, you know, in ICS security is dealing with right now is, is quite mind blowing. And that's been a, a risk identified in, in multiple cases is maintaining the old with the new. And it's, it's not like you can just go through and rip and replace all the old stuff, because in some cases that would mean taking what's called an unscheduled outage and, and translate that into, you know, a, the power stops flowing for a moment while you do these things <laughs> and nobody wants an outage. Um, so it has to be done carefully, methodically over time. And as you introduce you know, new technologies and take away old technologies, things don't always go the way they're planned. So it's, it's, it's just, it's so painstaking and so slow and uh, intentionally slow. You know, it's not like it's, you know, they're just slow and they're, they're dragging their feet. It, it's just, it has to be done this carefully to make it happen. So while you're doing this transformation, you're, you are, your job is basically to maintain security for this incredible, you know, historical legacy of technology all the way up to tomorrow's brand new widget. You are listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Thousands of organizations rely on Tripwire to serve as the core of their cybersecurity programs. Why? Because we detect suspicious activity before it becomes breach. Our systems work on-site and in the cloud to find, monitor, and minimize a wide range of threats. With deep system visibility and automated compliance, we help you shorten the time it takes to catch vulnerabilities and ensure your organization is following the absolute best practices in cybersecurity today. For more information, visit tripwire.com. That's tripwire.com. And so I bring that up not not to go down that 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 tangent because I think that's an interesting subject in and of itself. But yeah. to point out that the it you can't expect uh, a utility to deliver the same level of service while simultaneously implementing new technologies um, at the same cost, right? There are cost efficiencies to be gained, but it's not going to be um, it's not going to be you know a perfect flat line in terms of efficiency and cost. There are going to be costs that have to be passed along or paid for in some way, and so that I, I want people to keep in mind that sort of economic problem that's created right. by the desire for newer, better utilities and delivery of, of whether it's oil and gas or electricity, whatever it might be, water, uh, because that's the dynamic that we're talking about here. Like, you know, there's there's the data that, that you got to, but that economic problem is, is I think, key. Yeah, and I think that's what's driving the, the look at that data, because traditionally that data would be used for just managing the system, managing it more efficiently, getting you know, better at your maintenance cycles and having fewer outages and the outages last shorter periods of time, uh, that kind of thing. And, you know, mm -hmm. you can do greater event analysis and understand root cause for why problems happened. All of that is is still there and it's still going to happen and it's going to happen in new and more creative ways. At the same time, they're sitting on a gold mine of data. So, you know, what do you do with a gold mine of data? Well, you figure out how to, you know, actually turn that into the gold mine. Because right now it's just raw data. You know, have to make information mm -hmm. products to sell that are actually worth something more than just that raw data. <clears throat> so that's what I'm seeing is uh, the, first of all, you are not, you know, as a utility, you're not designed to hold all that data. I mean, there's not many utilities that really prepared to take in all of the sensing data and all the telemetry that they're getting now with all the digital stuff and keep it all, you know, for like some, some amount of history because it's, mm -hmm. it can be enormous amounts of data. So you see this now being shipped off to the cloud <clears throat> and it's being stored there. And since you've got all this data there and you know it's it can just kind of grow as much as you need, then there are this new um, interesting, like I guess uh, companies or firms that are starting up and they're creating basically their whole business model is to mine through that data for interestingness. And you know they're using you know artificial intelligence, using machine learning, and they're using you know standard tried and true methods, all in this mix to create information products that may be useful and may be sold to other parties. And you know not only are the utilities considering this as an option, but the you know the people that want to buy that data are also asking for you know ways to get this this data and tr transform it into useful information packages. 
So there's yeah. this whole new line of business that's cropped up in both storage of this data and then creating the analytical products from that data. Well, and let's talk about who those those sort of those first customers are, because I think there's something there that resonates with me as a, you know, sort of a, a product manager by trade in that if I've if I've put out a product and I have a customer who's collecting a whole bunch of data from that product, I, I want to know what it is because it's going to help me produce a better product down the road. Um, right. I think that's a, a, a very natural response to have as a, as a vendor. Yes. Yeah. And, and I think the best example I can give, we'll go back to the electric utility. So, you know, the transformers, those things that sit on the pole top or there's, you know, they're out on the, the sidewalk on a, a little concrete pad. And everyone knows when you hear the word transformer failed, because typically it means your neighborhood is out. You know, you, you, mm -hmm. you lose power for a while. Those transformers last, you know, we'll just say 20 years. And some of them last a lot more. We'll just say 20 years. And what we're finding is we now have enough, you know, data about how our system is operating to where we can see why our transformers are failing faster in these conditions and why they're living longer under those conditions. And it's because we have the data. Beforehand, we could kind of guess and speculate, but we didn't really have a lot of the surround, all of this, you know, data sensing the system around mm -hmm. that transformer, causing it to behave that way. So if I'm the transformer manufacturer, like for example, in your case, um, I can now get data about how my transformers are operating in the field and I can make a better transformer to operate under you know, the previous conditions where they're failing faster and make them last longer or somehow manage or handle those systems. So my mean time between failures of that product goes out longer. And if I can make my product last another 20, 30 years, I can charge that much more for it. It's that much more reliable. And, you know, utilities, their goal is safe, reliable power. That the last thing they want is a transformer to go out. So they're going to buy that product because it's it's got a longer life. It's got a longer depreciation. It's got better maintenance. They're going to have to roll a truck a lot less, which is just less liability. All of that fits their business model, too. So it's a, it's a win-win on both sides. And the transformer manufacturer rarely gets to see the transformer data at all because all they do is they get transformers when they fail. So they there's not much else they get. They get failure modes. They don't get any of that, mm -hmm. you know, how is it living kind of uh, in its environmental conditions. Uh, there's There's really no other way to get that kind of data. So that's just one example of taking some of that useful operational data that's sitting in your repository, mining some information products and selling that back to the transformer manufacturers, for example. And that, that's a pretty innocuous example because, you know, yes. it makes perfect sense, right? Here's a transformer. You know, we're going to take the data. We're going to build better transformers. But when we extend that model, when we start thinking about the other industrial systems that might produce, you know, sensing data. That's where I think it starts getting interesting. Um, yes. Because the transformer is is not doesn't have any personally identifiable data, certainly. Um, and it's it's really, you know, it's aggregate for whatever area it's serving. Right. Yeah, it's it's not customer data. And that's what everybody right. is is definitely I mean, it makes everyone kind of get a little itchy and freaked out when we start talking about customer data. But you know, I, I remind you that again, telecom has been doing this for years and it's there is at least some achievable corollary model that will work in a similar fashion for other industries. And well, honestly, and all, they, all they have to do is go, go to whatever legislative body they're trying to convince and say, telecom's doing it. <laughs> and, and it becomes well, and, a different discussion. <laughs> they, they, don't, you know, they don't have to do that until it, it becomes a problem either, because at this right. point, like it, 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 nobody, nobody would look twice at, at that, that existing scenario of the transformer data, that example. Um, and so it's that, you know, uh, the, the, um, what I have come to learn is an inaccurate metaphor of the, the, you know, the boiling frog that doesn't realize it's being boiled. Uh, but, um, that yeah. idea that if you do it slowly and, you know, it won't be, get noticed. Um, but, but what, I mean, where do we generate, is there concern to be generated? At what point does it become a, a practice that, you know, as a consumer, we should be concerned about? Yeah, it's definitely concerning. I mean, it is something that has to be done carefully. And I think there is a way to do it that allows for privacy. And privacy has to be, you know, I, I, what, I, what I don't want is for them to start down this path and then try to you know, kind of reverse engineer privacy onto the model that they've already chosen. So that, that would certainly be frustrating and it'd be less than successful. Uh, so we, there are ways to uh, get aggregate data from areas versus individual homes. Um, you know, or individual meters is technically how they're going to see it. And so there, there, there is ways, there are ways to get there to, to get this data in a, in a more 
I guess, privacy centered or privacy focused manner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, think, I, I think go ahead. that example of the, the meter is sort of the maybe the best one of, you know, if the transformer is pretty hard to, to you know, there's no data there that, that you can uh, narrow down to an individual. The meter, of, of course, is narrowed down to a, a particular property, probably a house, that kind of thing. Right. Right. And that's where if we could look at this more or less in aggregation, because typically aggregation, it's I mean, you can still de-aggregate and you can still de-anonymize. De and, you know, it's the level of effort that has to go into that, really. So if, the, you know, if you can aggregate enough and anonymize enough to get enough assurance that it's going to be, you know, difficult enough, um, then we can probably get to a place where we can start looking at using that as a revenue stream. I mean, it mm -hmm. is by far the uh, the, the richest and most profitable form of all the data, without question. <laughs> um, so you know they're going to try to do it at some point. I think it just comes down to coming at this from a, a, a privacy mindset. And there is already um, a discussion using, you know, when I think we're going to fill out our, our buzzword bingo card, um, but things like blockchain or, you know, the ledger technologies to try to anonymize the customer data um, you know, there there are varying degrees of success and there's enormous efforts to try to kind of de-anonymize even in things like blockchain or mm -hmm. similar technologies. So we may need to look at other models, uh, but I think there is still a path to do this uh, that will allow them to re realize that revenue and uh, still be able to do this that in a way that you know meets the privacy needs as well. I, there's just there's a balance to be to be hit there. I don't have all the answers, and that's I think part of what my 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 ask is or my call to the industry is is let's let's figure this out and come up with some interesting ideas and suggest them before they just start barreling down this path when someone smells the money at the other end of the trail. Yeah, yeah. Let's not evolve our way into into a situation where, as you pointed out, you know, while they're there's a, a strong tradition of adding privacy after the fact. Uh, I think we all yes. know it's probably not the, the best path to take uh, as well. Right. You are listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Thousands of organizations rely on Tripwire to serve as the core of their cybersecurity programs. For more information, visit tripwire.com. That's tripwire.com. When you think about the, the kinds of data, I mean, I, I think it's relatively easy for people to think about what what data could be produced today. But if we fast forward and think about where you know the technology is going, um, what are the kinds of data that that really you know are, are most interesting and most concerning that could be produced you know for you know these industrial organizations from the types of sensors that are 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 maybe coming to market in the next five years. Yeah, I, I think it's just we're getting finer and finer degrees of discrimination in sensing our environment. And honestly, that's that's the goal is to be able to understand your equipment or whether it's your water in the pipe or power on the line, gas in the pipe, you know, boxes on a belt, whatever it might be. I mean, SCADA is all just, it, you know, it's it's flow control, really. Mm, <laughs> um, yeah. So the better you can get at understanding the flow, managing the flow, seeing where there are problems with the flow and, and being able to fix those problems in ways that are faster, that don't require human operation. So, you know, honestly, the biggest liability for most of these organizations is having to get a human involved in the process. Mm -hmm. And the more they can automate that, the better things get. So the type of data I, I, I see us getting to in the not too distant future is a lot more of that self-healing. So we've got a system that understands itself well enough to be able to take some automatic actions to a certain degree. Obviously, you don't want to automate everything. You can automate catastrophe. Uh, but to a certain degree, where it, for under certain conditions, it will it will self heal. And that that's that's a good thing. Right. Because then you have to have you have to have less wait time for humans to interact and you know perform whatever tasks they need. And in most cases, the system will solve its own problems. So well, I think you, you that isn't a you bad. You can't help thing. thinking about you can't help thinking about how valuable that kind of a um, you know a, a change in the technology is in the face of climate change. When you know the electric grid, other utilities, the ability to, to to actually adapt to the environment is becoming more and more important. So so far, I see all positives. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. The the downside, the the negative side, I guess, is the human behavior aspect. We we're already in. You know, many would argue that, that we're in a surveillance state as it is. And the ability for, um, you know, we're already using things like 
did the per, did person A, you know, kill person B? And we're looking at the smartwatch data on person A to see if their, you know, heart rate got elevated at a certain window of time or, you know, the geolocation data of where that watch was at that moment. So we're already using all kinds of different technologies to try to triangulate more data about what humans do or don't do in unique and creative ways. Um, some of these things are great and some of them have some very, uh, you know, t obviously terrible and horrifying downsides. So I think it's that that as we get deeper into the ability to monitor everything, so you can look at the water, the gas, the power, everything that's happening at someone's location, and you can pretty much map a very clear picture, including all the you know telecom telemetry, a very clear picture of this person's day-to-day -day activities. And that, that becomes kind of frightening to most people is that they're really at that point, you know, the, the, there really isn't anything that qualifies as privacy any longer. So yeah, before we yeah. head down that path with yet another industry, that's where I think we need to, and I don't want to say stop everything, but we, you know, at best, we might be able to get them to tap the brakes. Um, so what I think the unfortunate challenge is for myself and my, you know, industrial security peers is we're going to have to basically pick up speed and we're going to have to catch up with where the industry is going right now with their desires and their expectations. And we're going to sync up alongside with them and say, oh, oh, hey, by the way, let's put some privacy into these things before you start taking off down this road too fast. Yeah, I mean, I, I would think that that eventually, if you take the alternate path of not building privacy in, in to start with, eventually you're going to run into the, the legislative requirement to to add privacy after the fact, which is, is usually more expensive and, and not as effective. Um, so it's yeah, almost a, yeah. a prepare for the future, prepare for the inevitable um, kind of right. call to action, I think. Yes, yes, yeah. and if we can get some at least some norms around this early on, we'll be we'll be better off. I look at things like facial recognition. We're already using it in places that is causing you know entire states to basically ban it. Um, yet at the same time, the federal government is is using it deeper in certain areas, and certain states are using it you know for unique and creative surveillance techniques. But some states aren't, so we end up with this kind of patchwork and hodgepodge of where it you know it it's frightening and where it's not frightening. So it, those initial you know, I guess initial kind of norm setting behaviors or uh, kind of protocols or practices that we start out with or, or hopefully can deter some of those more deleterious, you know, intentions. But it, it's it right now it's it's, it, you know, it's kind of all bets are off until we get enough people to step in and say, oh, hey, by the way, let's get some of these things built in now, please. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, I hope um, I hope that uh, you and I are both in a position in, you know, five years time to come back and have the same conversation about how successful uh, you know, <laughs> the industry was at building privacy in to start with. Uh, right. But, uh, that would well, be the ideal outcome. It's a, it's privacy and it's security. I mean, I think it, we started the conversation around trying to secure that breadth of historical technology. Um, now the, you know, not only are we from the industrial security perspective, the the enterprise security side of this gets different now that we're shifting all this data off to some cloud instance and we have to think about you know what it looks like in terms of where those information products go and the information classification and the handling of that data um that's that's something that a lot of these companies they're not experts at so this right. is a new field for them that is is tangentially tied to industrial control system security but not really so you know their, their security picture their security landscape and attack surface is now just going to explode as well yeah, that's super interesting. We we often think about about you know IT security moving into sort of the OT space, and and this is really an example of where OT is branching out uh, yeah. more towards IT security. I think that's a something that's important to keep in mind as well. Absolutely. Well, listen, Patrick, I want to thank you for the the time. I think it's a super interesting conversation. I, I don't think we we explored all of the possible angles here, um, as as is usually the case. Uh, yeah. But hopefully it was interesting for everyone who, who listened. Uh, and I'd like to invite everyone to tune in also for the next episode of the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Thanks for having me. You have been listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Join us next time as we explore stories of people protecting people and techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. We'll talk to you next time on the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast.